ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय भगवते वासुदेवाय गद्राज भागवतम कैंटो वन चैप्टर फिफ्टीन टेक्स्ट एटीन नरमाण्य उदार रुचिर स्मित शोभिता हे पार्थ हे अर्जुन सखे गुरु नंदने संजल पिता नर देव हृदय स्पृशा स्मर्तुंती हृदय मम माधव से नर्माण्य उदार रुचिर स्मित शोभिता हे पार्थ हे अर्जुन सखे गुरु नंदने संजल पिता नर देव हृदय स्पृशा स्मर्तुर्लुठंती हृदय मम माधव से नर्माण्य उदार रुचि स्मित शोभिता हे पार्थ हे अर्जुन सखे गुरु नंदने संजल पिता नर देव हृदय स्पृशा स्मर्तुर्लुठंती हृदय मम माधव से नर्माण्य उदार रुचिर स्मित शोभिता पार्थ हे अर्जुन हृदय कुरु नंदने स्मर्तुर्लुठंतीदय मम माधव से स्मृतुठंतीदय मम माधव से कर्माणी उदार रुचिर स्मृत शोभिता वैष्णवीस नर्माणी कन्वर्सेशन इन जोक्स उदार टॉक्ड वेरी फ्रैंकली रुचिर प्लीजिंग स्मित शोभिता डेकोरेटेड विथ अ स्माइलिंग फेस हे नोट ऑफ एड्रेस पार्थ ओ सन ऑफ टूथा हे 
note of address arjun arjun sakhe friend kuru nandana son of the kuru dynasty iti and so on sanjal pitani such conversation naradeva o king ridi heart sprushani touching smartuhu by remembering them luthanti overwhelms hrudayam heart and soul mama my madhavasya of madhav krishna translation by his divine grace is bhakti vedant swami shri prabhupad translation o king his jokings and frank talks were pleasing and beautifully decorated with smiles his addresses unto me as o son of prutha o friend o son of the kuru dynasty and all such heartiness are now remembered by me and thus i am overwhelmed the verse has no purport so the next verse 19th शय्यासनातन विकट्ठन भोजनादीश्व ऐक्यादयसरतवानी विप्रलब्ध सख्यु सखे पितृवत्तन सर्व से हे महान महितया कुमते रघम मे ट्रांसलेशन पर्पोट जनरली बोथ ऑफ अस यूज टू लिव टुगेदर एंड स्लीप सिट एंड लॉइटर टुगेदर एंड एट द टाइम ऑफ एडवर्टाइजिंग वन सेल्फ फॉर एक्स ऑफ शिवैलरी Sometimes, if there were any irregularity, I used to reproach him by saying, "My friend, you are very truthful." Even in those hours when his value was minimized, he, being the supreme soul, used to tolerate all those utterings of mine, excusing me exactly as a true friend excuses his true friend, or a father excuses his son. Purport: Since the supreme Lord Shri Krishna is all perfect. his transcendental pastimes with his pure devotees never lack anything in any respect either as a friend son or lover the lord relishes the reproaches of friends parents or fiances more than the vedic hymns are offered to him by great learned scholars and religionists in an official fashion om agyanati mirandhasya gyananjani shalakaya chakshuron militam yena तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नमा विष्णुपदा कृष्णपृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिदेशिणे वाजाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा ग्रेटफुल टू बी हेयर विथ ऑल ऑफ यू एंड आई सीक द ब्लेसिंग्स ऑफ द सीनियर डिवोटीज सो दैट आई कैन स्पीक ऑन दिस वेरी हार्ट रेंचिंग सेक्शन ऑफ द श्रीमद भागवतम सो आई स्पीक ब्रॉडली ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ हाउ आवर मेमोरी इज आवर ग्रेटेस्ट ट्रेजरी when facing tragedy so memory treasury tragedy that's the theme i'll discuss so i'll discuss in four parts i'll explain first what is going on in this particular verse and this chapter then i'll talk about the relationship between memory and reality and then what does memory actually mean and then finally how we can make our memory into a treasury so this section of the shrimad bhagavatam is in one sense foreshadowing 
what is eventually going to come in the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam is a book spoken in the shadow of a tragedy. Mm. The tragedy was that India, sorry, that <laughs> I was going to give a comparison, but yet Krishna had appeared in the world, Krishna had established Dharma in the world, but then he departed from the world. So dharma was established, but the Lord had departed from the world. Now, so, looking back at that time, brings both great joy and agony. That Krishna was just here recently, but Krishna has gone now. So, there is gain and there is loss. So, I have been recently working with a devotee who is writing a book on many of Srila Prabhupada's pastimes before he started his con. So, he's doing a lot of research. So, in the 1950s and 1960s, to give a mundane example, India was living in the shadow of independence. There was joy that India had become independent, but there was sorrow that there had been the trauma of partition. So that event casts a long shadow. It's only in the last one or two generations that the people born this generation are not scarred by those memories. So here, Arjuna is facing probably the worst situation that anyone can ever imagine. Sometimes some people have very active imagination and some people have very active negative imagination. So they can keep imagining anything and everything that may go wrong. So generally speaking, for a person, their own death is probably the worst thing they can imagine. It's horrifying to think of. However, if we, if we truly love someone, we care for someone, we are dedicated to someone, then to imagine that person's departure is actually a hundred times worse than imagining one's own departure. For a parent, to think of their child's death is, you know, a parent would be ready to lay down their own life to protect their child. So that is far worse to imagine. So in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, there are two main traumas that are depicted. One is Bhishma facing his own death. And Arjuna facing the death of departure of his Lord. And both of them face these traumas in a remarkably similar way. That is, by taking shelter of their memories. They both remember Krishna. And externally seeming that it is that Bhishma has Krishna in front of him. But it's interesting that in all the prayers that Bhishma offers, Bhishma does not use the second person to refer to Krishna. Bhishma uses the third person. Not Twam, but Tam. Tamima Mahajam Sharir Bhajam. So, why? Because in one sense, he has closed his eyes. Although Krishna is in front of him, unlike Haridas Thakur, who is beholding Nayane Dekhiya, he was beholding Krishna's form. It is Bhishma has actually closed his eyes. And he is, he knows Krishna is out there. But the Bhagavatam doesn't just want to define or demonstrate that Bhishma Dev's departure was successful in devotional terms. He wants to demonstrate that his success, his departure was success in universal terms. Devotional terms means that for a devotee, the Lord is there, the Lord's devotees are there, the holy names are going on. That's a glorious departure. But in spiritual terms means that there should be the right time, there should be the right place. That's why Bhishma waits, multiple reasons why he waits. But he waits till auspicious time comes along. And then when he departs, yes, he does say Krishna is God, but he turns inwards. This is the yogis would meditate on the Lord in the heart. Dhyana vasthita tadgate na manasa pashantiyam yogi no. So like that, Bhishma meditates in his heart. And that is how he becomes absorbed. So in one sense, the Bhagavatam through this depar departure is demonstrating the pathways for yogis to embrace Bhakti Yoga. That what you consider as a success, the ultimate success of life. Here Bhishma, he never went to a forest to practice yoga. He was involved in what we could call the worldliest of all worldly professions. 
that is politics and war. Of course, there are many more worldly professions, but the idea is that it entangles one a lot. So, but in spite of that, he was successful. Such is the transcendental potency of Bhakti. So that is Bhishma taking shelter of his memories of Krishna. And now here Arjuna has faced, we could say, what is a far worse catastrophe. Now, in life, we all face losses. Sometimes we may lose some money we invested somewhere. Sometimes there may be a misunderstanding and we lose a friendship. Sometimes there may be an accident and we may lose a limb. There can be many kinds of losses. But we can broadly classify losses into two. Basically, for living in life, we need means and we need purposes. We need what we live with and we need what we live for. So, for somebody who has a, his indefatigable spirit, that person, even they lose their wealth, it's painful. They say, okay, you know, I have my family, I have my wealth, I have my intelligence, I'll earn wealth again, no big deal. It's a big deal, but it's not a huge deal. So, to lose what we live with, hmm? we live with money, some people may lose their reputation. Hmm? Nowadays, in social media, they say that, that for many people, infamy is like their worst nightmare. If people are talking badly about you, that's the worst nightmare. And the nature of the world is that fame and infamy come in duality, as come as a, come as a binary. So to the extent we'll be praised, we'll be criticized. So sometimes if we are praised, when we don't deserve that praise, then it's, it's best to be a little apprehensive. Because soon we will be criticized when we don't deserve it. And, but the point is, no, normally those were thought of the duality, you know, fame and infamy. But in the world of social media, they say being criticized is not as painful as being forgotten. <laughs> so they say any publicity is good publicity. Even infamy is better than oblivion. And anyway, so the point is that in this world, some people may lose fame. But then, for them, Fame can also, reputation can also be regained at times. So, but what we live with if we lose, that's bad. But if we, what we live for if we lose. Somebody say lives for their family. And then in an accident, maybe their whole family is killed. Then what am I living for? Why should I even continue living? That becomes a question. To the worst nightmare for a person, if you want to imagine worst nightmares, is to lose simultaneously both what we live with and what we live for. And that has what has happened to Arjuna. He has lost what he lives with, he has lost his archery skills. Tadvai Dhanus is the same bow, the same arrow, but his archery ability is mysteriously, horrifyingly deserted him. And as if that were not bad enough, Arjuna was defined by the world as an archer. Now he defined himself not so much as an archer, as a devotee. That's why at the end of the Gita, after hearing the Gita, he doesn't say, I will fight. He says, I will karishe vachinam tava. I will do your will. He's not defining himself as a kshatriya. He's defining himself as a devotee, as a bhakta. But for him to lose the Lord simultaneously, that means he's lost the means and he's lost the ends. Both. And it's difficult to imagine a more devastating, in common parlance, is called as a double whammy. Double whammy means one whammy is like a knockout blow, double whammy is two knockout blows coming simultaneously. It's, it's almost impossible to recover from it. And yet, how does Arjuna recover? He recovers by his memories. He's taking shelter of his memories over here. And he starts, he's in front of Yudhishthir and Vanjitosmi Maharaja. He says, I'm, I'm not just deprived, I'm deprived of everything. The Kshanav Yogena, one moment of separation from him, 
was like millennia and now I'm forever separated from him. How can I live? And then he starts spontaneously speaking these verses. And in that sequence, the two verses for today's class are coming over here. So Arjuna has described right from his early days how Krishna helped him at various stages in his life. Their first major partnership was in the Khandava forest when they together fought against the Devtas and they rescued Khandava forest from the evil dark beings who had taken over that forest. So from that point Arjuna narrates his various memories. Let's look at this verse. So sometimes it's helpful to put a framework for verses to understand them. So here you can see each line is talking about one thing. See, quite often we say that with respect to even uh, public speaking or just meeting people, now what we say people may forget, but how we made them feel that they will remember. And that's because our emotional memory is much more than our rational memory. Our rational or informational memory that is basically facts, figures, data that stays. But the emotional memory is subtler and it goes longer. So first, he is speaking, you know, it is about he's remembering Krishna's words. So how did Krishna speak? He's saying that if Krishna spoke words, Ruchirasmita Shobhitani, he spoke large hearted words with a gentle smile on his face. He was joking. He was so intimate with me. So he was remembering less than the words, what he's remembering the way he spoke. His Udar Ruchirasmita Shobhitani, with a gentle smile, with a large heartedness, he spoke. And what did he speak? He's, he's remembering how Krishna affectionately addressed me. He partha he sakhe arjuna, he arjuna sakhe kuru nandaneti. So he's remembering four forms of addresses. And we see the bhakti culture is very personal. That repeatedly characters refer to each other by names and not just one name, multiple names. But because these point to multiple attributes of the Lord. So the impersonalist idea is that the absolute truth is beyond names. The personalist understanding is the absolute truth is beyond being described by any name. And therefore we should have as many names as possible. So that as many attributes of the absolute can be described. So our understanding, the impersonalist understanding is the absolute is indescribable by words. Our understanding is the absolute is inexhaustible by words. No words will exhaust the reality, the richness of the absolute reality. So he's talking about how Krishna called me by these various names. And then he's remembering what was the effect of those words on him. He says that Rudraspusha, he says that they touched the heart in such a beautiful way. Sanjal Pitan Naradeva Rudis Prushani. Rudis Prushani, that those words touch the heart so much. And the gopis also speak the same thing. Madhuraya gira valgavakyaya. He says, Krishna, your, your gira and vakyaya, they refer to two different things. One is the tone of speaking and vakyaya is the word that are spoken. And both of them are extre extremely sweet. And what do they say is that these touch our hearts. Rudas prashani. And then finally he's thinking about how so how they affected me then and how they are affecting me now. Smartur luthanti rudayam mamama davasya. So those memories are rising in my heart. Luthanti. Luthanti means overwhelming. They are overwhelming me completely. Mamama davasya. Whose memories? They are Krishna's memories. And then in the next verse, which is purport on this, he's saying about how when we were joking, shayasana, we were sitting, we were chatting, we were lying down. And he said, Vikatthana Bhojanadish. Vikatthana means, he said that just among friends, sometimes friend, different friends have different ways of dealing with each other. So among close friends, he said, Kshatriyas, often they brag about their prowess. 
Hmm? Now, bragging word has a negative connotation, but it is the declaration of their prowess that it shows their spirit. And when sometimes Krishna would make some over the top claims, is something which is not real, he would speak that. So he said that I would chide Krishna by saying, Aikya dvaya sirutavan te viprilabdha. So he says that, Ritavan, yeah, what you spoke is true. Now, sometimes what happens, somebody else is speaking something, and we know it is not true, they know it is not true, but the one way to expose it, not say that it is not true, yeah, it's completely true. Then, it's like a sarcastic way of telling a person that what you're saying is, saying is actually not true. So he says, I was sarcastic with him. Hmm. Suppose if somebody cooks prasad for the first time, and then, and then they, they offer prasad and they know that the prasad has not been cooked very well. We know that the prasad has not been cooked very well. But they say, yeah, it was, it was nice. Now, nice is a word which can hide many emotions. <laughs> so anyway, so he says, Rutavan. He says, I spoke those words. And then he says, yet, although I was being sarcastic, actually Krishna doesn't brag. Even if Krishna has not done something, he can do anything. He can single-handedly he can show the whole universe manifested in his body. So there's nothing beyond Krishna. So for Krishna, it is not any bragging. He can transform his words into actions when he wants. So he's saying, Sakhe, Sakhe, Pitravad, Putra, Putrasya. He says that just as a friend forgave a friend, just as a father may forgive a child. Like that, he forgave me. So here the mood is also very subtle and different. Sometimes if we meet some devotees, especially, I just came from Australia a few hours ago. So in especially in Australia and America, we have many senior Prabhupada disciples who are still existing. And not all Srila Prabhupada disciples uh, are, are very prominent. Some of them, we may have never heard about them also. So sometimes uh, they may say, you know, oh, you, you are a disciple of so-and-so guru. You, you, you know this? You know, we used to take lunch together, we were doing this in Yurindaman, we used to travel together in the bus party. So now, it's sometimes natural that they tell. So sometimes we may not know their glories, it is for them to tell their glories. And then the way they tell their glories is by, they're telling their relationship with somebody whom we know is glorious and respectable. Hmm? So that is fine to the extent it goes. We want to know the glories of devotees. But sometimes, what happens is, sometimes that same thing can be spoken in a little bit of a snide way. Sniding way, snide way means, you know, yeah, actually, like somebody may become a great Bhagavatam speaker and thousands of people may come for their classes, you know, actually, you know, I taught him Bhagavatam. When he had questions, it was I who taught him. So this is not, there is a remembrance of the past, but the remembrance of the past, here Arjuna's mood is, oh, I devalued him. Hmm? And I was wrong. But here, in this kind of things, there is a remembrance of the past, but it is actually, we are devaluing the other person. You think that person is so great? It's not so great, you know, actually I am great. So, the same action can be done with different motivations. Here, Arjuna's mood is, yeah, I was wrong. He's not thinking, oh, Krishna is so close to me. He's an ordinary person. Here, familiarity has not bred contempt. He, but familiarity, later on the feeling is that, oh, how could I have been so familiar with Krishna? Now, Krishna wanted that, that was pleasing to Krishna. Krishna wanted that flavor of the relationship. But still, he doesn't feel that way. And say, hey, Mahan Mahitaya Kumate Raghamme. He says that, that Mahan, that great person, he tolerated Kumate Raghamme, all the misbehavior, all the misdeeds, he just tolerated. And then as this series of verses goes on, he moves forward till he comes to the remembrance of the Bhagavad Gita. And then, that is when he becomes peaceful. He becomes peaceful. So, I'll talk a little later about how the remembrance of the Bhagavad Gita makes him peaceful. But this is the context. So now, let's look at the relationship between memory and reality. I'm talking about, broadly about the topic about how Arjuna, in the, mid of in the midst of tragedy, has taken shelter of the treasury of memory. So basically, if we consider a four-quadrant uh, four quadrant diagram, you know, we can have reality and memory. 
Hmm? So, at the right top, we will have there is the reality existing and the memory of the reality existing also. Hmm? At the left bottom, we will have there is no reality and there is no memory. Hmm? That means that nowadays, many people elevate unreality to the level of reality. So, the nature of life is sometimes we say the world is dukkhale. And people just can't accept this. It's very pessimistic. Life is distressing. People, even if it's their lived experience, they find it very pessimistic. But what everyone will agree with, more or less, is there an echo? Okay. What everyone will agree with is, if, even if life is not distressing, it is boring. <laughs> the daily life is the daily grind is not exciting for most people. So what people do is, they go into unreality. Unreality is through the entertainment industry, through the movies. And in the past, see, entertainment has always been a part of human society. And Krishna also talks about this, that's fine. Yuktahara viharasya, regulated entertainment. So entertainment can be a break from the boredom and the burden of life. But nowadays, with everybody hooked onto their phones and their devices, then it is not that entertainment is a break from real life, is real life is a break from entertainment. <laughs> Yesterday I was coming by flight from Australia. There's a person sitting next to me. He was saying, you know, throughout, he was saying, okay, what is going to be the result of this match with Morocco and Spain, Morocco and Spain, Morocco and Spain. I think that was the match, I don't know which country it was. But finally, he just, finally we landed, and then the network came, and literally, apparently Morocco won. I mean, he's an Indian, most Indians have not even heard the name Morocco before the football matches. But literally in the airplane, he started dancing, Morocco won. <laughs> so, it seems football mania is gripping India. It's like, sometimes I say that, you know, there, is, there are multiple levels of misidentification. When there is cricket mania, for example, you know, for, there are three levels of misidentification. First, we identify with the body. Then we identify with the country in which the body is born. And then we identify with the game that is popular in the country that we are born in. <laughs> <laughs> so it is misidentification, misidentification square, and misidentification cubed. <laughs> <laughs> but you can say with respect to football, India is a non-entity in football. So it's misidentification quadrupled, <laughs> no, not even cubed, <laughs> raised to the power of four. But anyway, for people, it'll be drawing into unreality is what they look forward to because reality is so boring. And that is what becomes their primary memory. So they have these memories and sometimes you know, there are this, if after any sports match, there are this trivia. Or any TV series you have nowadays, nowadays with the internet, anybody can put any information. So every single dialogue that every single character has made, there are elaborate encyclopedias of these. And there are, there are like big quiz competitions where they have, okay, this dialogue is sim by, made by this character in this movie. That is similar to which character and which dialogue made in which movie. And people who get that, they win big prizes. So it's like people, they are using their memory to withdraw from reality. Hmm? Of course, there are some people, sometimes, so when the, there is no reality and there is no memory, that is where the attempt to withdraw itself fails. Hmm? There's once a... There was once a, a drama actor. He, he invited a famous actor to his show for, a perform, for, for watching and reviewing. And when he was performing the drama, that famous actor fell asleep. And then this, he, was, he was a young actor, he was a rising star, and there was an old actor. So he asked him, Sir, you know, I had invited you for a review. How could you fall asleep? He says, son, my sleeping is the review that you need. <laughs> that means your acting was so boring that I fell asleep. <laughs> so the idea is, sometimes people may try to withdraw from reality to memory, but the me no memories are only formed. 
it like the movie is boring or the game the sports match is is completely undramatic i was invited to speak in america in one college i was going to that college i asked the dude which college is this they call it the american institute of illusion <laughs> because actually making good illusion is not easy it requires a lot of hard work it is about making movies and dramas so there is no reality and there is no memory then that is like one person does not get any no reality means what we, we have created some story but that story does not leave any memory then that is completely boring so there is there is memory without reality and all the superhero movies movies and the tv shows all of them people have their memories are filled with that and what happens is they get some retreat they get some shelter at least they think they are getting some shelter from real life and for many people this is what helps them face the drudgery of life now yes we can take shelter of memory but then it can be when you are taking shelter of memory is it tamasic is it rajasic it is satvik is it satvik Now there could be the third quad. I'll come back to this later. But then there is there is reality, but there is no memory. That means we experience something, we go somewhere, we have done something, but we just don't remember anything about it at all. Hmm? And that means again that did not help us build any treasure. So for us, especially as devotees, it's not just that we want to do some rituals. we want those rituals to shape our memories now the memories may or may not be conscious i'll come to that later but there is reality and there is no memory then that means whatever was experienced in reality was completely uh forgettable we can say nothing sensation so the ideal situation is there is a rich reality and there is a rich memory that is formed from that reality and that is what bhakti is meant to be about now in the bhakti tradition the idea is that say prabhupada says when a person comes to a temple their mind may be agitated but the deity is be decorated in such a nice way that the whole temple atmosphere be organized such a way that people's mind calms down the idea is that have as many soothing soothing uplifting inspiring stimuli the ujwal nilamani uses the word uddeepan spiritual stimuli which can inject spiritual memories into the hearts of people and those memories those memories are what will become our treasury so the best situation is where there is a higher reality and there are abundant memories of that higher reality and in one sense later we'll see shukadev goswami that is what he is doing for parikshit maharaj he is filling his heart with memories of krishna how krishna rescued and elevated and liberated great souls across history across geography across cosmology in different universes and that is how our memory can become a tool for helping us face this level of reality and take us to a higher level of reality sometimes people say that as a new zealand say you know, i said that i was personally saying you know, your bhakti world view sounds quite interesting so i said yeah bhakti is a world view and bhakti also offers us a world to view <laughs> it is not just a world view world view is yeah you look at the world this way you look at another this way but what our understanding is this is the world and you can look at this world from this way this way this way it's interesting we can get more information but what bhakti says is apart from this world is another world and that world can also be viewed so bhakti offers not just another world view but another world to view so for us bhakti memories are not just meant to help us retreat from the reality of this world when it becomes boring or distressing but it is also to rise to a higher level of reality arjuna here is not just in a mood, mood of lamenting remembering oh this happened that happened oh we did this together he is actually moving closer and closer to krishna and that's what eventually he realizes when he remembers the bhagavad gita 
he remembers yeah krishna is still with me he has been thinking at one level you know it's arjuna is thinking that i am a kshatriya and i have to win this kingdom that's what he was thinking at the start of the bhagavad gita krishna told arjuna you are a devotee and you are fighting this war for fulfilling my mission but as he moves forward his thoughts move forward he remembers that actually he is not a kshatriya he is not a warrior all that he requires for remembering krishna his goal is krishna even if krishna is not present externally krishna is present internally and all that he requires for remembering krishna is his memory and thus he becomes absorbed in krishna so that was the second point the relationship between memory and reality a third point i'll discuss is so what do we mean by memory now some people say that you know i just can't remember verses i can't remember classes i can't remember points well memory can be of different kinds and when the gita is talking about memory or when bhak, when in bhakti in the bhakti tradition we talk about memory about remembrance it, what are we talking about has to be clearly understood it's not that we are talking here about factual memory factual memory is somebody asks you okay what is the square of 25 you know most of us we learned it we can remember it means 625 somebody asks what is the square of 53 yeah you know i had learned it since 53 years ago <laughs> maybe 35 years ago 25 years ago i don't remember it now so our factual memory is going to deteriorate we can't avoid that it's it's just a matter of aging we can of course by using our cognitive faculties decrease the rate of decline but that's going to happen it's not factual memory it's not even conceptual memory you know this question i remember i had heard an answer to this question i can't remember the answer when it is being talked about it is not factual memory it is not conceptual memory although these can help it's more talked about is personal memory personal memory means that we remember the person we remember the person and we remember our relationship with that person we remember our responsibility in relationship with that person to understand the difference between these kind of memories let's consider a child who is sick and how the mother remembers the child and how the physician taking care of the child remembers the child now the physician may remember the wbc count the rbc count the platelets count this count that count far more accurately than the mother but who actually loves the child it is the mother so the doc for the doctor now in the particular frames the, all those parameters remembering them is important they are not to be devalued but that that remembrance does not convey a personal relationship that's why there is a difference between knowing about god and knowing god that knowing about god the doctor knows a lot about the child but the mother knows the child and similarly when we talk about memory of krishna there might be academic scholars who may know much more about krishna than what devotees do they may know okay this is said about krishna in this book and that is said about krishna in that book and this and that they may be able to give references also sometimes better than devotees but do they know krishna do they have a personal relationship with krishna it is that personal relationship and the remembrance that comes through that personal relationship that is what is being sought when we when we love someone we naturally remember that person conversely and this applies especially in bhakti when we remember krishna our love for him also will grow that remembrance however is of the person krishna and of our personal relationship with krishna and it was this was the prabhupada's emphasis when prabhupada was asked at one time in his conscious history the gopi bhav club was formed where devotees wanted to discuss esoteric past times of krishna and prabhupada said the way to enter into radha krishna's intimate past times is by spreading krishna consciousness all over the world and he says what is the two got to do each other prabhupada said that lord in his most intimate manifest radha krishna together have come as, as radha rani as chaitanya mahaprabhu and chaitanya mahaprabhu is given the instruction spread krishna bhakti all over the world so to remember the lord is not just to remember oh 
You know, this past time here, that past time there, that past time there. To remember the Lord means to remember our relationship with the Lord. To remember our responsibility in our relationship with the Lord. And that's what will make personal memories. Personal memory doesn't just mean just remembering the person Krishna. It remembering our personal bond with Krishna. Now, our personal bond with Krishna does not depend only on our personal interactions with Krishna. That we say, oh, I didn't have any interactions with, we may feel like that with our spiritual master. I don't have much personal interaction with my spiritual master. This is what happens sometimes when the Vyasa Puja celebrations come up. The more some senior devotees talk about their personal interactions with the spiritual master, all the other devotees get infected with a poverty mentality. That, you know, I will never have interactions like this. And now that, is, that should not be happening. We all need to be feel enriched by the blessings of Krishna and our spiritual master that may come through many means to different people. So, I talked about these two pastimes, primarily in the Bhagavatam's first canto. There is a Arjuna's pastimes and there are Bhishma's pastimes. Or Arjuna's taking shelter of his memories and Bhishma's taking shelter of his memories. We will see Arjuna's memories are eminently personal. He's remembering how when I was weaponless, when I was chariotless, at that time Krishna saved me. He's remembering how so he has many a rich reservoir of personal memories to draw from. In contrast, if you look at Bhishma's memories, Bhishma's memories are not that personal. Yes, they are there. He talks about how he charged towards me, his head, his, there was sweat and blood on his forehead. But then he's also remembering how Krishna was, uh, was uh, enthroned as the Agrapurush, as he was given the highest honor of the Agrapuja. Now Bhishma didn't play a big role in that. Now he also remembers how the gopis went mad in remembrance of Krishna. He said, They went completely mad. Now there is no report anywhere of Bhishma meeting the gopis. And if you look at the whole Mahabharata, there are no very intimate interactions with Bhishma and Krishna uh, in the Mahabharata. They met on many occasions, but it's nothing like the interactions between Krishna and Arjuna. So, but Bhishma is also able to take shelter of those memories. Although his stock of personal memories of Krishna are not that many. In fact, the longest encounter that Bhishma has with Krishna is on the battlefield, when they are on opposite sides. And Arjuna is shooting arrows. Other times, you know, Krishna comes, but what has happened is that it is after the kingdom has been bifurcated and Hastinapur is at one place and Khandaprastha has become Indraprastha. So Krishna comes primarily to meet Arjuna. So Krishna Arjuna's friendship is formed at the time of Draupadi Swayamvar. And after that, when they come back, they go to Indraprastha. So therefore, Krishna and Bhishma never get really time to meet each other much. So there's no record of Bhishma ever having gone to the Yadu kingdom, as far as I have seen. So the point is that Bhishma doesn't have much personal memories. And Arjuna has a lot of personal memories. And yet, neither is stopped in their remembrance of Krishna. And even when Arjuna has so many personal memories, the list of memories that he recollects, they are not just the memories of his personal interactions. He is also remembering how he witnessed Krishna helping Bhima when, in the, when Jarasand had to be killed. Now there Arjuna was not the hero. Krishna's mercy fell on, on Bhima. And Bhima was empowered to overcome Jarasand. So Krishna is remembering that. So the idea is that the, the experience doesn't have to happen to us for it to become a memory within us. If it happens to us, it's wonderful. But even if it happens to someone else, if we are seeking a close relationship, if we are having that devotional disposition, then how Krishna interacted with someone else, how a spiritual master interacted with someone else, that itself can have a deep impact on us. And that brings me to the last part that so I discuss what, what does memory mean? And the last part is how do we build our memories? So at one level, it is simply the practice of bhakti. 
that is centered on remembering Krishna and that itself creates memories. Now, over a period of time, if we are continuously practicing bhakti, the content of our memories will change. Now, not, our memory is such that there is no delete button that comes with it. Now, whatever impressions we have had in the past, they are going to be there. So they can, our past remembrances can't be erased, but they can be overwritten. They can be overwritten. And now, so we can't delete our memories, but we can choose what we remember. From our past, whether it will be a pre-devotional past or even a devotional past, so we can look at all the things that happened wrong in our life. You know, it could be before we came to bhakti, people treated us badly. Sometimes even in bhakti, we feel, oh, I was treated unfairly, and this happened, and that happened. Now, it, now, it's understandable at a human level, if we are wronged, we will feel hurt. But what is our purpose in Krishna consciousness? If those are the memories that are the strongest in our consciousness, then we are not Krishna conscious, we are more hurt conscious. We are more victim conscious. We all will be victimized. Sometimes people think that, now because I am a good person, now people should treat me nicely. Well, the world doesn't work like that so always. Like thinking that because I behave nicely, everyone will behave nicely with me, is like thinking that if I go into a competition of matadors, you know, there are these wild bulls, and you go into there, and then you expect that, oh, oh bull, don't charge me, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> you know, whether you're a vegetarian or not, the bull is mad, the bull is going to charge. So, like that, whether we are good or bad people, bad things are going to happen to us in the world. Of course, if we are good, we are not doing any further bad karma, so that worse things won't happen to us. But, it is for us to choose how, what will we remember? All the times when we, when bad things to happen to us that we didn't deserve, if that's what we remember, then we are not being Krishna conscious. Or we can remember the many times when good things happened to us that, didn't, that we didn't deserve. Now we got the merciful association of some senior devotees, we got some intimate service, we got some success in some service, although we knew that we didn't really work so hard at it, whatever. You know, we all have memories about how Krishna and, Krishna and Krishna's mercy, Krishna's devotees have enriched our life. So, ultimately, it is a matter of choice for us. It is for us to choose which memories we cultivate. The memories that we recollect. So, memory, can, we can say like a stockpile from the past. But the stock, from that stockpile, we draw some things. So, what do we draw from the past? Right now, of course, in the present, we can try to do our activities more consciously so that even in the present, we'll be forming fresh and wonderful memories of Krishna Bhakti. But when you look at the past, the memories that we draw from the past, now they will what will become prominent in our life. And that's why it is ultimately an act of our choosing. When Krishna says, Mattaha smritir jnanam apohanam cha, He says, I give knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. The Acharya explained that this is in reciprocation with our desires. That if we seek remembrance, Krishna will give us remembrance. If we seek forgetfulness, Krishna will give us forgetfulness. So if our prominent desire or our prominent disposition is complaining, blaming, resenting, then all the good things that have happened to us, we, we will forget them. It is as if they didn't happen to us only. We will get forgetfulness of all the blessings that we have got and we will get remembrance of all the burdens that we are carrying. On the other hand, if our desire is to connect with Krishna, Bhajatam Preeti Purvakam, Krishna, you are my Lord, you are so wonderful. Even if, I, if it doesn't feel, Bhakti doesn't feel right, wonderful right now, I know it is wonderful, I want to remember you positively. If we have that disposition, that intention, then Krishna will give us remembrances of all the sweet and uplifting experiences that we have had in Bhakti. And Krishna will give us forgetfulness of all the negative experiences that we have had. And that's how it is both by our conscious endeavor and Krishna's grace 
that our memory will become like our treasury and eventually when we all will face the ultimate tragedy that is we will face our own demise if by that time we have made our memory our treasury where naturally spontaneously powerfully luthanti like overwhelmingly our consciousness is crowded with remembrances of krishna then antakale chamameva smaran muktva kalevaram we will remember krishna and we will attain krishna so i'll summarize i spoke four points today the broad topic was how our memory is our greatest treasury in facing life's tragedies so i talked here about how arjuna is facing the worst imaginable tragedy to lose what we live with is bad to lose what we live for is worse to lose simultaneously what we live with and what we lose for is absolute worst so arjuna has lost both his archery skills and his lord and how does he cope with it by remembering krishna and that's what previously bhishma has also done and here arjuna is doing that so that was the first part the second part was how does our memory act as a shelter so we talked about four quadrants that there is memory and reality so if there is no reality that means people go into entertainment but the entertainment is still boring then there is no reality no memory and then there is no reality but there is a lot of memory of it people go into some forms of illusion like sports movies tv shows video games and then for people today entertainment is not a break from reality of real life real life is often a break from entertainment so because there is no reality to it it may give temporary shelter but it doesn't raise one's consciousness and if there is reality but no memory that means we go through act, we are practicing bhakti or experiencing krishna with ultimate reality but if we are mechanical if we are ritualistic we are perfunctory then we won't get much benefit from those practices when there is both reality and memory then it's most empowering so bhakti not only gives us wonderful spiritual stimuli uddeepan by which our experience of reality in this world can be enriched can be enhanced uh, but it also points us to another reality so bhakti shelters us amidst this reality trauma and bhakti powers us to another reality it's not just another world view but another world to view and then we'll talk about memory what do we mean at the third point it is not just factual memory or conceptual memory it's personal memory personal memory doesn't necessarily mean that our personal interactions with that that particular person whom we are remembering is more that remembrances of that person as a person so bhishma doesn't have as many personal interactions with krishna as arjuna has but both of them find a shelter in their memory of krishna and how do we build our memory it is by two things first is we try to be as conscious as possible during our day to day experiences so that those create greater impressions those become richer memories and when we look at the past we consciously look not at the things that went wrong with us or uh, the bad things that happened to us even within devotional life but the blessings that came upon us and if we consider the memory to be stockpiled that those memories we draw from repeatedly they will come up more naturally more spontaneously more forcefully and in this way our memory will become a treasury that will ultimately take us beyond the tragedy of death to krishna for a life of love eternal with him thank you very much hare krishna